Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Victoria Tucker. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm one of the organizers of the paper project. So for accessibility reasons, we're gonna be doing visual descriptions of ourselves. Um, and I am a white woman with light skin and long straight brown hair with green eyes. I'm wearing a black t-shirt and a gold necklace. Um, so firstly, yeah, we wanted to thank you again for, for joining us. I know that the attendees can't see how many other people are on the call, but at the moment we've got 129 and there are people filing in every second. Um, we're really, really looking forward to the conversation today uh, with our speakers, Laura and Harshada, who have been really generous in sharing both their time and their thoughts with us, um, both today and also in the run up to this event as well. So for those who were not able to attend our first seminar two weeks ago, I'll give you some background about how this project came about. Um, so the paper team is a small group of PhD researchers at the University College London's Anthropology Department in the UK. And it's comprised of myself, of Charlie Dominic, Emily Glazer, Alice Riddell, and Ioana Manusaki uh, Adzimopoulou, who are also on this call with me. Um, the project was born out of our experiences of learning and practicing ethnographic research methods, but also from discussing these experiences with our colleagues and our friends in both our department and others across the country. So what really catalyzed the formation of the paper project was the recent establishment of our department's anti-racism committee, uh, or the ARC, which was formed to specifically to address questions of anti-racism and coloniality at a, at a more structural level in our department. Um, and the formation of the ARC indicates to us that there's a possibility for a sustained change in our department. Um, so we felt that by problematizing the practices and the rituals of ethnographic research, it's a way that we can address the questions the ARC is working through. And so we've developed our project in conversation with uh, and with support from members of the ARC. So our intention is to create an open space for dialogue on the intersectional questions of power and positionality across the politics of ethnographic research that we hope will ultimately lead to pedagogical change. Um, this is the second of four seminars. There's also gonna be two workshops that are for PhD students in our department. And those will culminate in recommendations for teaching uh, for our department, which will be working to embed into pedagogy from September. And that spans you know, from undergraduate to PGT to, to PhD level as well. So I'll hand over to Charlie now, who will give you a bit more information about this particular seminar. Thanks, Victoria. Um, and hi, big welcome from me too. My name is Charlie Dominic. My pronouns are she, her. A quick visual description of me. I'm a tattooed white woman with light skin with long red hair and wearing a white t-shirt, orange lipstick and clear rimmed glasses. So this evening's talk focuses on the role of witnessing and participant observation and features Laura Agustin and Harshada Balasubramanian to discuss the politics of witnessing and participating as ethnographers. Laura Harsha, thank you both so much for being here this evening. You're going to be uh, showered with praise and thanks, I think, <laughs> by the team by the end of this event. So before we dive into the session, um, a quick note about audience questions moving forwards. For those uh, of you who are here for seminar one, tonight's format will be slightly different. So after each presentation, there will be time for audience questions specific to that speaker, which will be around 10 minutes. So if you've got a really burdening question that you, that you really, really need to ask, that's really the time to do it. Um, we will also have time for a general Q&A at the end in order to bring together the speaker's content and hopefully with the audience's help, tackle some overarching themes that address the ethical and political implications of the forms of witnessing we as anthropologists undertake. So we ask you during this seminar, seminar to please ask questions by raising your hand. Um, for those unfamiliar with Zoom, this can be found on your screens in the bottom sidebar and it's called the raise hand function. It has a little uh, yellow hand emoji. Um, our wonderful chair, Alice, will call out your name and someone on the paper team working in the background will unmute you. But if you prefer to remain anonymous when asking a question, feel free to use the Q&A box function. And if we have time, Alice will read your question to the presenters. So if you do want to ask an anonymous question, that's there for you and we can read it out for you. So we, re we are a really large audience tonight, which is brilliant, um, but please bear in mind that for both accessibility reasons and in order to maintain a sort of open and collegial environment with as 
little Zoom chat as possible. Our speakers will answer questions verbally and only during the allotted Q&A time. So now that's out of the way, I can introduce you to Alice Riddell, who will be our chair for this evening. Alice is a first year PhD candidate in digital anthropology at UCL and a member of the paper organizing team. Her research explores a live streaming street crime app called Citizen and its impact on neighborhood relations in New York City. She is particularly interested in questions surrounding the impact of urban peer-to-peer -peer surveillance, the complex complexities of citizen journalism and the emergence of the digital panopticon. In addition to conducting research, Alice produces teaching and homework resources for Anthro schools and initiative working towards decolonizing the A-level curriculum, improving the accessibility of anthropology as a discipline and introducing younger students to the social sciences through free and open source materials. And I'll hand over to Alice now, take it away. Oh, hi, and uh, thanks and a third welcome from me. Uh, as Charlie said, my name's Alice Rudell. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a white woman with faded pink hair and bad roots, um, and I'm wearing a black polar neck. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Victoria and Charlie, for the introduction, and a huge thank you to the entire paper team, including Ioana and Emily, who are behind the scenes making all of the magic happen tonight. And of course, thank you to our incredible speakers, Laura and Harsha, for joining us today, and for all of you attendees um, as well. Thank you for coming. Um, I came to join paper much later than the rest of the team, this meant much of the laborious and less glamorous work was already complete. So I'm really grateful to the team for welcoming me on board for the more fun and engaging stuff, such as the honor of being your chair this evening. Um, before we start, a couple of uh, extra housekeeping points. Um, this is an open space, encouraging productive yet challenging dialogue about complex and often uncomfortable issues. With this in mind, please be thoughtful and engage with integrity. There is no room for racism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and classism in these seminars. Marginalized folk are under no obligation to educate you, share their experiences, or comfort you during these seminars. And we ask you to be mindful of any assumptions that you make about others present at the event. We will have two moderators, one managing the chat and another on hand in case any issues arise. Um, the series will be recorded and available on our website after the fact. Um, a trigger warning to consider uh, is this series may contain content that is distressing or uncomfortable as we address examples of microaggressions in our department, intergenerational trauma and other forms of violence as a result of our discipline's colonial history. So if at any time you need to leave the room, log off and take some time for yourself, please feel free to do so. It's very easy for the host to readmit you if you just send a message. Um, finally, please remember this is also an informal event and uh, while everything we're discussing is complex and far reaching there's also lots of space for laughter and joy so we encourage dialogue to be considered considerate and fun uh, on that note allow me to introduce our speakers tonight our first speaker Lara Augustine is author of sex at the margins migration labor markets and the rescue industry as well as many media essays academic articles a novel titled the three-headed dog alongside her website the naked anthropologist you can find her on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. All of these are on our websites and will be put in the chat throughout the evening. The paper team are lucky enough to call our second speaker, Harshada Balasamaranian, our colleague, who is also a PhD candidate in UCL's Department of Anthropology, researching the role of creativity in social change. Her PhD project is funded by London Arts and Humanities Partnership, studies the experiences of practitioners adopting virtual reality in the creative industries asking how they form and reform ideas about who and what VR is for. A defining feature of Harsha's work so far has been exploring how non-normative epistemologies and practices may help to critically rethink anthropological fieldwork methods. Uh, and, that, and on that note, I'd like to pass over to our first speaker, Lara, um, to take the stage. Well, hello, thank you for all of these. Uh... All of all of these common com commentaries and and I, I find it all really fascinating. I'm not in the academy myself and and but I'm, I'm really I'm fascinated. Um, listen, since I don't know who's in the audience really, and I assume that some people know a lot about what I'm doing and some people don't know anything. I'm just going to say that the name of the book that Alice said was is Sex at the Margins, Migration, Labor Markets, and the Rescue Industry. It's an edited version of, of the thesis that I produced for a research degree 
I did at the Open University a long time ago, uh, 99 to 2004. <clears throat> In general, what it does, what I'm talking about here is I'm addressing the disconnect that I found as an ordinary person in Latin America between how I and my friends and many, many acquaintances, ordinary people talked about traveling to Europe and to work and how Europeans talked about them and us. And particularly it addresses poorer women migrants with only two options for work because they're undocumented, being living, live in made or selling sex. My focus of study was the Europeans. So I'm, I decided to do this in the most accessible kind of personal way that I, that I can imagine, which is to tell how I got into this because my even going and getting a PhD was completely off the wall and never expected. I just remembered that I forgot to describe myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm probably the oldest person of, of, of all of us. I have uh, gray and white hair with, in tiny plates. Um, I'm wearing a blue scarf, um, that's it. Um, so there I was. Most of this is about me for the first part. So um, just just get get a sense of that. So I was wandering around in different countries of Latin America doing odd jobs, and by the mid '90s, everywhere that I went, <clears throat> trips. They were called trips, not migration. They were called. That's what everyone was talking about, and it was just coming up all the time. People talking about it, and I said I had odd jobs. For instance. For instance, I had a job at the um, at an AIDS prevention project in uh, Dominicana, the Dominican Republic, with bar girls who sold sex. And uh, I had to visit lots of different places. I visited uh, a bunch of their families who live in very rural, beautiful little shacks. They have to be called shacks. The, the family's happy to be supported by their daughters in Spain and, and uh, Spain, Switzerland, and Paris, and um, and I went to towns that are really open marketplaces for finding someone to help you travel, uh, particularly if you wanted to sell sex. But and there was another town on the other side of the island where there are no women on the street under forty because they're all live-in maids in Spain. <clears throat> I watched viewings, viewings of a film from, that was sent by the Netherlands to discourage women from migrating in which the police were violent and everything was horrible. And then there were supposed to be conversations among all the kind of country peasanty, uneducated women in which they all said, this is unbelievable because we all have sisters and friends who are there and already did this. And it's not like that. They, uh, a group of these women in, in Santo Domingo, the capital, gave a day conference once. So now we're back in, it's like 1994, um, in which they, they were black, poor women, but they did self-identify as sex workers. This is quite early for this. Um, and lawyers and different kinds of predictable people came to, to talk about the problems and stigma and the usual kind of things. But there was also a representative of um, a certain kind of feminist organization who, who stood up and told them that they were wrong to call themselves sex workers, that they were prostituted women. Now, my reaction from the back row, I, I, I never studied these topics. I hadn't studied feminism. I'd been a, in women's movements since the 1960s. So, you know, I'm 75 years old. I remember a lot of this. Um, I didn't, I'd never studied prostitution. I didn't study feminism. My reaction to this woman coming and saying this to them was, how unbelievably rude, this is completely shocking. How could she talk like that? How could she talk like that to the hosts who have organized this? It seemed unbelievable to me. So I had long been an anti-imperialist anti and a, an anti, I was against big development, you know? It's, it's the soft, soft imperialism that Europe and the United States do now about other places that they, they don't 
invade, they send humanitarian <clears throat> and development people. I, I'd never read anything about this either. I was just against it. But so I was filled with questions about all of these, how people were talking about people migrating, which it was still called travel. That's what we called it. And so my common sense was that migrants are ordinary. The poor want to travel as much as anybody else. They're adventurous. There are people who are bored, who want to get away from their boyfriends or their horrible fathers. They're ambitious. They hope that there will be new horizons somewhere else. None of it was negative. It wasn't negative. So obviously the people that did this felt they could take on the risks. Um, so, I, so I went to Europe and wandered around. I used to do loads of wandering when it wasn't so difficult to cross borders and things. And um, I visited many kinds of projects, uh, different kinds of people in different countries. I pick up languages and speak them badly and don't mind. Um, any, I, <laughs> I, I went all over the place, anywhere where the topic was migration. I went, I looked at church bulletin boards. I, I ended up in some funny places. And what I found was that no Europeans ever talked about these topics the same way my friends and I did. It was absent. And at the same time, I, I'm always talking to migrants in the street. I, I, I'm pretty much a street person. And so I would hang around in all kinds of different places and talk to migrants. And everything they said confirmed what I already knew about how people said it back in Chile and Argentina and all the other places. So I found this enormous discrepancy between our way of speaking and their way. And so I had personal questions. My personal innocent questions were, why do people talk like this about foreign women who have arrived here? Why don't they talk to the women themselves? If they did, they would, they would hear what it's actually about. Why do they assume that they know how everybody else should live and what the right way to live is? That was a big question. Uh, why do they assume they know? And what's the problem with prostitution? Because at the end of it, the, more than half the screaming was about prostitution. So I wanted, I wanted to read. I, um, the only way to do that was to go to university. The first thing I did was a master's degree in international education. I, in, I got in, that was not the problem. <laughs> but I encountered enormous hostility from academics and from local people, which about how I talked about things. Um, <laughs> and it, that it confirmed my, my questions. What is the big problem here? Why are people freaking out and screaming me, screaming at me? And so I, I went, I ended up doing a PhD, which I had never had any idea to do, but, and I had no idea about disciplines. That is, I did not choose anthropology or anything. I, I just knew what I wanted to read, but I just knew that that could be in any field at all. Um, and I ended up in cultural studies at the Open University. And that was because they had a fellowship that I was eligible for not being a European at the time. Now I am. Um, <clears throat> Anthropology emerged as a good lens for doing what I wanted to do, especially when I had to address questions of sex. The, the presence of sex in the room when I talked was simply, it was always a bombshell. It was always enormous. Um, so I found using anthropology had a calming effect and that I was observing and being very quiet. The first presentations that I did um, I had people freaking out and I had to learn what, what, is, what is this about? So for instance, um, I would talk about migration as a, a process, uh, the reasoning that uh, poor people would have, why they would get into these situations, what they, how they made their choices and how they might change those choices once they got abroad. And people were very upset because they wanted me to talk about slavery, child abuse, human rights, the damage of prostitution, and mafias or organized crime. 
And I didn't talk about any of those things. They, they were not of any interest to me and they, I didn't see the relevance. Um, I learned to use cultural relativism and I got hell for it. I got complete hell for it everywhere that I went. An example of that would be, I'm, I'm in Spain, I'm talking to people where there are lots and lots of very young Nigerian women selling sex in the street. And they would object that it was obvious that a lot of these girls were underage, that they were, in fact, they could be 14 or so. Um, <clears throat> and what did I think about that? And what I would do <laughs> is I would say, in the place that they come from, they are considered grown up. They are considered grown up enough to have sex and to, and to make this journey and to get to this place. Um, I understand if you are offended and don't want them in your country, <laughs> then you will do whatever you do to get rid of it, but don't tell me that they are miserable, damaged, uh, etc. There was always a huge flap. There was always a huge flap in the room around me, um, and I, but I simply stood my ground. It helped to be older. It helped to, that I entered this with a great deal of life and experience, and I did not allow people to, to shut me up. Um, I had to argue very hard with my academic uh, supervisor for long to do long-term participant observation. So now I was definitely calling it anthropology um, in Spain, which is a place that I have I had lived many times. Um, and so the question is, what was I studying? So my original proposal that I sent to them and I got in, I got accepted because of a proposal called the production of prostitution. That is, how did this concept come about? Who's making this into this great loaded horrible thing? Um, so what I said I would do in my participant observation was <clears throat> observe projects to help migrant women. So that's a nice big category, projects of any kind. The people in those projects were mostly middle-class, educated Europeans. I called them in their great variety because they were not at all alike by any means, social agents, so that's that's what I called them, social agents. And this was called, by now I had read Laura Nader's um, article from 1969. That's how old this is, um, called Up the Anthropologist. And it's about studying up. And that was clearly what I was going to do. That is, I didn't want to write about migrant women. I had no questions about them. I already knew I was one of them. I had sold sex, I had migrated many times, I had traveled, I had gotten a lot of trouble in my life. It was not odd to me. I was not going to reveal anything to myself about that, but I didn't understand what all this helping was. Um, so I lived in Spain for the next five years and I visited absolutely everywhere I could, all over the country. I, I joined meetings, I introduced myself to people on the street, I got invitations to speak and write things. I was the only one talking like this, of course. I was the only one. So as a foreigner, I was allowed in a certain way to say things that were considered spectacularly taboo. Um, I, people like epidemiologists, I had to learn how to read epidemiology and understand what was happening there. I talked to people in national government, city government. I visited a lot of nuns who had uh, shelters. I visited doctors, uh, leftist kind of progressive projects. I went out on <clears throat> street outreach with more than one kind of van. <clears throat> and what I was doing was observing them and I always explained what I was doing. But frankly, I don't think they ever believed me. They, they told, what they, what they talked to me about was the migrants. So they told me what I needed to know about migrants. And since I already had my views about migrants, I, I found this very interesting. Okay, here they are, they're, they're uh, uh, perceiving these things this way. They never talked about themselves, never. Um, I didn't hide my background, um, but I mainly listened and just hung out with them. 
occasionally when something very dramatic happened, I, um, I intervened and, 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 and asked a question or said something, but generally not. Um, so all during this time, I was living in Granada in a sort of cave-like place. Um, and, and I was reading in, in, in every kind of uh, field that you could think of. I had stipulated that, that I wouldn't have to stick to anything. And I got tremendous inspiration, just for examples, by reading about 19th century travels by uh, people from South America to Europe in which Flora Tristan and others who then wrote extensive accounts of the curious habits of the Europeans. I loved all of that. I felt that I, that I was discovering lots of, uh, lots of history for what I was doing. Of course, I was uh, very interested in Orientalism um, and I met Edward Said. Uh, so it was clear to me that it, there was no question, it was all colonial visions of, of foreigners in Europe. But I settled on governmentality as my framing the theory, because I wanted to know about the behavior of these social agents vis-a-vis -vis the migrants that they were said to be helping. So um, I, governmentality is, is how authorities know, find out about, know and classify populations in order to regulate and control them. Um, for example, in my case, um, I found that there was consistent, it's, it's, and it's still consistent everywhere now, that what the migrant women were saying themselves uh, would be disqualified disqualification as a mechanism. So the thinking was, if these people are uneducated or they have low culture, or in the case of non-migrant women, someone has forced them, then they cannot govern themselves. Others have to do it. I did a very deep history of prostitution um, to figure out, I mean, I went, way, I went all the way back to, you know, Babylonia of how this identification is produced. It was extremely interesting and I recommend for anyone interested in prostitution to, to do that in some kind of way because it's not just a question of switching terms from prostitute to sex worker. Um, the key discovery that I made was, um, took place in the European Enlightenment which is now my least favorite um, period in history. So kings had fallen, the nobility had, were taking a back seat and it was the bourgeoisie that came to power. And they came to power particularly in, in big cities where they were debating all the time what was the proper way to live, how, how houses should be, how families should be, how children should be treated. Um, the importance of work, of course. Um, they believed in progress. They believed, so this got me into a, another wonderful area um, about the, the concept of time. So that what I discovered that seemed so clear to me was that the Europeans have an idea of the stream of time in which some people are ahead and other people are behind. Uh, the Europeans are the farthest ahead and that everyone else is situated somewhere back, going back into primitive life and struggling to catch up so that it is the, the job of the most enlightened people to try to help the, behind, the backward people to, to catch up. Um, particularly, there was a phenomenon that came to be called in, in the last century, the rise of the social, in which uh, projects to fix all of these poor people and people who lived wrongly in Europe, um, people in the East End of London who didn't get married and were drunk in the street and all of those kinds of things that the, the idea was that the, all that needed to be fixed and these people needed to be lifted up. During this period, um, the prostitute, who before had just been considered a bad girl and, and hopeless and uh, part of the community, more or less, was now uh, identified as not a bad person, not born bad, but fallen. 
someone had done something terrible um, and this woman had fallen. And this is the point at which rescue begins, real rescue um, is 200 years ago, that these women could be redeemed, that if people went out and found them and lifted them up, they would, they could join the mainstream and, and be good women. Of course, they were going to be maids. However, this was considered virtuous and not fallen. Um, and I found out that at the, exactly the, the same period, there was a growing number of uh, European women. Now think about the earliest of this is in the top of the northern part of uh, Europe and, and England. Um, there was a growing number of women who wanted to do some kind of paying work. And there were no jobs except uh, being governess and they didn't want to do that. There was nothing considered respectable at all. And um, so it was discovered, I'm cutting really short things, it was discovered, it was understood that educated middle class women were uniquely gifted to identify and help and save these poor people, particularly prostitutes. And so they were identified as needing to be rescued. And in the course of this quite incredible um, gift that they had, they constructed a very benevolent, good, sacrificial, positive identity for themselves, which means they have a vested interest in it, whether they're getting a lot of money for these jobs or not. In the next 200 years, I saw that there was really no improvement for, for prostitutes at all. That is, I did really deep history. Um, but if you look at in those 200 years, what happened to the social sector? Well, it's enormous. It's enormous and it has a thousand of branches and a proliferation of possibilities. Um, and so what happened doing all this reading in the background and then I was all over Spain doing this was that I saw that all of this from the past was still going on, that it hadn't changed at all. Um, that the subjects that I was looking at were still, now that by now there was a total acceptance that middle-class educated European women are more or less are the correct arbiters for taste, values, morals, that they're the ones who know this is still a belief. There's still a belief in the stream of time in which Europeans, the first world, whatever you want to call them, are ahead and that the people who come from other countries are somehow still behind. Um, we're still in the phase where um, women are divided. This is patriarchy, we're still there, um, in which women are divided into good women and bad women. Well, nowadays the bad women are called victims. But that's only a rhetorical change. It's still a division, the assumption is that those correct arbiters from the middle class are the ones who know and that everyone should be there with them. And so that if you're somehow, you're not in the East End on the street anymore, but you're somehow doing something that's considered bad and unhappy and you don't know that about yourself because you were forced or confused or you didn't get enough education or love or whatever. And so now you're a victim. So the conclusion is still that you must be rescued. There isn't any real change in that in these, in these 200 years, we are there. Now, if you look at the, the book, Sex at the Margins, um, I guess it's cultural studies. It's also anthropology. It, um, it has chapters on the ideas that um, a lot of the ideas that I've mentioned and a lot of other ideas basically about travel, what we think travel is and different, different labels for people who's a tourist and who's a migrant and all that kind of thing. And, and then I examine service work because uh, selling sex is always disqualified. It's not really service work somehow. So I, I did loads about that. Um, I also studied the maids the whole time. I, I, I mean, I, that's another whole talk I could give about the maids. So I was very moved to listen to Daneri la, last week. She represents the kind of person that I've known since I was 
very young and she's in a, a, a situation in London that is exactly like what I studied. Um, That's uh, five minutes, Lara. Right. So um, the kind of concepts that come out of this that in general <clears throat> that I looked at <clears throat> that Europeans constantly proposed were solidarity, empowerment, self-esteem, outreach, cultural mediation, feminism, violence, epidemiology and public health, and the thing called agency. And of course, it was always, I was always seeing how prostitution, that concept of what it is, this bad thing, prostitution, is continuously reproduced. Um, I did, for the field work, I did, I produced narratives. They are dramatic vignettes um, that where I, I chose, I forget, eight or 10 topics to show some of the kinds of things that I saw so that I would write, I wrote a dramatic representation of a scene that I remembered that had actually happened. The, these things actually happened. Um, and most of them had some drama in them. And I was present and I, so I said also what I had done, what part I played. And you will see when you look at them that sometimes my, my unhappiness or something, that sometimes I showed my, my feelings and sometimes I didn't. Um, and then after that, I analyze each of them. And um, so, as I said, solidarity and all those, the, all those concepts ended up coming up over and over, whether it was a pamphlet for, for how, to, how to have sex or, or some kind of epidemiological graph. It was always, these were the things that came up. Now, I would have to say, you know, that Sex at the Margins, obviously, I, I, I edited it so that it would be um, not so academic. I took out all the academic jargon that I could, and I shortened it a bit, and I made it clearer. Um, so that other people would be able to read it. And obviously it didn't, it, I never thought that anyone would be reading it, but in the end, in the end it was published. And I, it hasn't stopped any anti-trafficking fanaticism and it certainly hasn't uh, daunted the rescue industry in the slightest, that's bigger than ever. Um, but it did provide a kind of basis for resistance to all of these, endlessly sensationalist things that are said in by everyone really and it's just as it's it's worse than ever um the book still sells it's uh, it's read in many 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 university courses but unfortunately what i have to say is it's still a hundred percent relevant that is it was published in 2007 the work that I had done had ended in 2004 look how many years later it's still a hundred percent relevant. Um, as uh, Alice mentioned, in 2017, still interested in how I could get this message across, I, I, I published a novel, which is the story of migrants of different kinds uh, in the sex industry in Spain. It's called The Three-Headed Dog. Um, I'm always still trying to work out how to get the message across. So I do a lot in, or I do a, some stuff in in social media and, and I have a website, I have a blog that I, I did for years and years. And then what happens is you get very um, tired of the fact that it's always the same questions, it's always the same things happening. Um, so I was very glad to be invited to talk about this side of things, how, how I studied up. I believe that studying up, I, it came up last week also, for those of you who were there, someone said, should we be, um, should we be interviewing the managers at uh, UCL about what they're doing? My, my answer, I almost shouted out, yes, that's, that's obvious to me. It's obvious to me that in these questions of, I guess you could call social justice, that looking at how the powerful people exercise power is extremely interesting. It's extremely revealing. I should also say that while at the beginning when I hadn't read anything, I was very angry all the time, I became very unangry 
by the time I'd read all of this stuff and understood a very wide big picture and, and a sense of history, I was no longer angry. I understood why people were producing this discourse this way and why they weren't changing. And so my comments when I make them are really, I don't know, I sort of do snarky stuff, but I, I just try to uh, point out, yes, you're looking at vested interests. You're looking at people who have, who have constructed the, their, their whole identity is about, um, is about the, this benevolent thing that they're doing. Um, I think it's super interesting, and I'm uh, I'm happy to answer anybody's questions. Um, and you can write to me. There's a contact form on my on my website. And I think that's all I need to say. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, uh, you are a wonderful storyteller, and uh, I felt swept away on the journey. And it was all really fascinating, with much to unpack. Um, and we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so yeah, please raise your hand. I will call out your name and um, one of the team members will unmute you and then just ask your question. Um, and if you'd like to say anonymous, um, just uh, send a question in the Q&A. Um, and I've seen uh, the, the first hand up is uh, Vanessa. Yeah, you're now unmuted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. So um, I have a question actually for Laura. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm interested in knowing about if it, it might be connected to um, religion and the fact that religious patriarchy came in and that broke away with this idea of sacred sexuality that women used to do before and how do we do do we do these women still maintain a link to that um to that enacting of sacred sexuality well if you talk about very very specific that you you can't can't possibly generalize about what what prostitutes or sex workers do around the world there are very particular stories in places like india about that what you've just described they are tremendously disputed however there's tremendous disagreement about that in the general kind of way in my field work and in my reading i did not find religion to be a particularly important thing i know that ever since i started doing this people blame evangelical christians and for a lot of stuff however in spain for instance and not only in spain um, the most enlightened, the best people were the were the leftist nuns. So that's really as far as I'll go on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Maria. Uh, you should be able to speak now. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Hi. Um. Thanks for the lecture. It was so interesting. Um. What are your views on modern forms of sex work, such as OnlyFans, for example? My, my own personal views? To me, these are all, I, I began talking about the sex industry and commercial sex rather than prostitution very early on. I, I understood right away that there were dozens of different jobs that people had and, and you couldn't generalize. and. Um, and, and so I, you know, I've watched, I've now been watching this for 25 years. It's a long time to be observing something. And, and to me, it's, um, I, I, I never judge, is that really sex work or not? I, I think that the person themselves is allowed, are allowed to say whether they feel that it's a form of sex work or not, whether they feel that they are, are selling sex. So uh, to, to me, I don't, I don't have to make a judgment about whether it is or it isn't. Thank you. Um, it feels strange telling people that they can now speak, but um, uh, uh, Peter, I think your hand was was next. Hi, Laura, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, listening to you, you talked about 
the resistance you had with your academic advisors, the reactions to your work, and also the fact that um, the people you were uh, uh, observing didn't quite believe that you were observing, that you were intending to observe them. Um, listening to that, something that was coming to my mind was this, I think, an old idea in anthropology, that anthropology is something that is done on non-European people. Um, and the idea of doing anthropology on European people um, is, is something that I think anthropology still has, has trouble with sometimes. I was wondering if you think that is, that is a way of, of, of looking at it, if that's something, if, if that is how you would characterize what you were encountering there. Um, I didn't name disciplines, you know, like sociology or anthropology to people. I would just say I'm, I'm doing research. I would say what university I was at and where I lived and um, that I, w I wanted to know about uh, the whole sector in, in Spain for helping migrant women. And that that's all. I didn't use terms like participant observation. I told them what I was interested in, that I wanted to know what they were doing and why they were doing it, and could I just watch? And, and, they, and they just simply said yes. No one ever said no. No one ever said no. I think that uh, social agents are glad that someone might be interested in, in what they're doing. Um, they don't think they're doing anything wrong, as they probably are not in the big picture. And um, and so there was never anything. I mean, I, I know what you're, you're saying. Obviously, there's enormous political stuff about if one were, if I were trying to uh, research those poor migrant women, oh, those poor victims, then there would be immense ethics reviews and stuff like that. There was nothing like that. It was not required. I was simply, it was as though I suppose it was sociology, but they didn't think that it was real research, I guess, in the sense of I didn't have a survey or anything. I went to meetings and talked to people and I went out with people. So it doesn't really fit the, the colonial idea of, of how you go into a place and, and live amongst the other. Thank you. Thanks. And we, we have a couple of uh, questions uh, coming in on the Q&A. Um, do you see a shift in how reflective European saviors are since you started your work? A shift? No. No, it's very bad news. From my point of view, uh, it's very bad news. Of course, there are all the time individuals, including individuals who were anti-prostitution or abolitionists who ended up changing their mind a little. But in general, no, in general, it's, 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 it's worse than ever. And now you have, so I'm talking about 25 years. I don't know the age of some of you, but there are people who have grown up and heard only victimizing, trafficking stories their whole lives so that it's now the whole idea of trafficking, and I didn't even use this word previously in my talk because it wasn't necessary uh, at that point uh, because things weren't called that, but then they began to be. But so it, 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 it turned into, um, it's turned into something that's like a fact, like, oh, oh, there's a war in Afghanistan, or oh, and that's been going on a long time, or oh, oh, something is happening in Lebanon, oh, right, that's always bad, or whatever, or Israel, Palestine, there's one, oh, that's right, that's always going on, oh, trafficking, that's another one of these terrible things. So that you have the vast majority of the world who have just grown up seeing these particular sensationalist bits on the news, that's how most people hear about it. They don't read anything. They don't know anything except what they see in the media. And, and it appears to show factually all of this stuff. So <clears throat> if there have been individuals who have changed, that's good and I'm sure of it. But in general, the situation is a thousand percent better, worse than it was. Um, thank you. And there's another uh, good question coming up on the chat. Uh, have you found anthropology a hindrance or a help towards the decriminalization of sex workers and strengthening their rights? What more can it do to assist the cause without drawing largely upon saving poor exploited women type narratives? 
I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I, I didn't like being in the academy myself, so I didn't stay. So I don't, I haven't read every single thing that's been done. I, I know in general, but I don't, uh, I don't have access to academic articles. And I, so I know I'm a more a kind of a public intellectual person. So what anthropology itself could, could do, I don't know. I'm sure that I, that I believe that, um, that more people should be studying Europeans or powerful people or the mechanisms, how did this come about? So that I actually found out why the women who seem so unreasonable and patronizing now do what they do. I found it in history. It was a tremendous piece of knowledge to understand why this continues and doesn't change. So I believe that studying the managers at, uh, at UCL who do these terrible things to the cleaners would be marvelous. I think we could make a big difference if there was loads of this stuff happening. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question now and then the, we can circle back round um, at the end. And uh, Sophie has her hand up. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. I was really interested in the way that you described how the infrastructure of social work and social care has been built around this figure of white women as saviors. And I was interested to know if you think there are any, I guess, continuities between the way that sex workers or prostitution have been characterized and then contemporary social categories, for instance, like the refugee or the unaccompanied minor, um, or even like the Muslim woman in contemporary discourse. Well, yes. I mean, I left all that out, but of course, in the in in the course of reading everything, I a great deal of of the book and of what I talk about is about migration, and and certainly what you what you see is is endless reproduction of more categories with more difficult identities uh, amongst the, in the migration discourse. And that some of them, the, the point seems to be to, to teach us all which are the worthy victims and which are the victims that are not worthy. So those are the economic migrants, those people need to get out. Um, but anyone who could, who could be underage or who could be running away from something terrible or who, or who could be an oppressed woman, well, that's, then that's a slightly different category. It's, it's completely, you can do, you could write, you know, a gigantic book just about the, the questions that you said. So it is the proliferation of discourses <clears throat> in this. So I ended up calling it the rescue industry <clears throat> because this was a long time ago, right? So this was 2000, I don't know, four, when I argued about the title with Zed Books. Um, the rescue industry got into the title because it was already in 2004, obviously a large diverse thing with different branches and different people doing very different things. And there was already a lot of money involved. And what you can see if you study what the topics that you that you um, put out there is that, yes, in the migration field, in ones that have nothing to do with prostitution, you will see all of these same things happening and all of these European experts who can say who the, who the real victims are and who the bad people are. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. And um, thank you for all of the questions. Uh, that have been coming in uh, really varied and insightful and um, you will have another chance to ask questions to both Lara and Harsha at the end um, so please hang in there if we haven't got quite got to you and hopefully there'll be questions that are relevant to both speakers um, so yeah now I am pleased to hand over to our second speaker Harsha Balo Samaranian. Hi everyone I'm delighted to be here in all of your company today thank you so much for having me um, I think I'm brimming with questions too for Laura, so I'll be glad to take part in the Q&A later. Um, first and foremost, I would like to sincerely thank um, the organisers for this series and for having invited me to participate. Um, the organisers have demonstrated the feasibility and the value of offering a platform for both established and early career researchers, and they have set in motion some vital conversations that I certainly hope we'll be making more regular in our teaching and our research. 
So to introduce myself, um, my name is Harshada Balasubramanian, but I tend to go by Harsha. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I have brown skin and black hair, which is currently out. Uh, the top I have on is a maroon shirt with a collar. Um, if I was a character in a theatre production that you had come to experience, you might ask for this kind um, of audio description, a verbal commentary on visual details like my height, my skin and hair colour, my costume and the stage on which I am performing tonight. Audio description or AD tends to be offered to theatre goers who identify as blind or partially sighted, but I would argue that everyone may at times be tempted to encounter this art form in action. In addition to verbal descriptions that you'll hear through your headphones, when you do go to the theatre and receive audio description, you will be invited on um, an audio described touch tour of the stage to hold the props, feel the outfits and even try out some of the gestures used by characters. It was a summer's afternoon in 2015 and London was creaking under the weight of a muggy breeze. Two women walked the Richard II set at Shakespeare's Globe Theatre, thre thre threading their course between drooping curtains around a silent throne and out onto the flat tongue of the stage which jutted into the audience seating. I was witnessing my first touch tour, not as an audience member or as an audio describer, but as an anthropology undergraduate on her first fieldwork. One woman held the elbow of the audio describer who walked a step or so um, ahead. They walked together as part of a technique called sighted guide, which is predominantly used by blind and partially sighted individuals when they would like to support, uh, when they would like support to navigate unfamiliar places. Maintaining such contact while walking side by side, not only forced walkers to learn and accommodate each other's rhythm, posture and stride, but it became necessary to communicate and navigate changes in cooperative ways. If the audio describer tripped or was knocked, the person holding the elbow felt the jerk and readjusted. If the person being guided swerved, their fellow walker would take note and must respond so that they can keep walking. The visual environment in my field site emerged in my ethnographic notes, not as objects that my gaze fell upon, but as a coordinated rhythm of strides, pauses and swerves, which revealed how describers and theatre goers navigated and hence perceived the environment in each other's presence. Until then, my accounts of the visual in my field site had presented an absent world, a world that screamed at me, largely by maintaining its silence throughout my notes. This is because I myself identify as blind, that is, someone who does not use eyesight. Having previously hated the term blind for its negative associations with ignorance, I am now reclaiming it to call out and uproot the stigmatization that it perpetuates. Rather than avoiding visuality in my fieldwork, I deliberately fight to conduct research in hypervisual contexts, such as theatre. I'm willing to accept the view that blind people have nothing to say about seeing. Yet, when I first got to the field, visuality manifested as a resistance to my quote unquote blind body that soon came to define my relationships with interlocutors. After all, I know I have black hair and brown skin because, well, sighted people have told me so. Some might interpret this as a classic form of epistemic violence where I end up parroting stuff I cannot even testify to witnessing. The mobilization of sensory ethnography um, in methods cast classes filled me with some enthusiasm, but it did not provide solutions for understanding the one sense I could not bring to the fieldwork 
and how it that really informed my relationship with my participants. I may write about vision as a blind anthropologist, but only as a political battle against marginalization, a disembodying experience intensified by my language, which cannot help but abandon my own somatic references for the numerous expressions in English that epistemi epistemologically privilege vision, such as let's take a closer look or shed some light on that for me or make that more visible. While this account is true, it is not the only way in which I am experiencing vision and have experienced vision. For me, this kind of account risks foreclosing discoveries of how visuality can be engaged with through multiple senses. Let me tell you that I was the woman who took the audio describer's elbow that summer's afternoon in 2015 as we collaboratively perceived and moved through the Richard II set. My relationship with interlocutors was not just defined by the abstract, resistant ways in which visuality surfaced, but also by how they worked with me, as in my participants worked with me, to navigate these resistance, and how in this process we took part in and embodied our co-production of visual knowledge. Physical proximity was absolutely crucial here. The quality of a two-way corporeal exchange is unique to the sensory modality of touch, as when, as when touching, one is touched back. This task of moving whilst in contact vastly increased our capacities to shape each other's bodily experiences and thereby specify how we perceived each other's each other's bodies, especially how they differed from our own. In this way, it was possible to interpret our e efforts to move in mutually convenient ways as sites for negotiating various understandings of our differences. So what I've tried to do in the last few minutes is to live up to my bio, <laughs> particularly the claim that I am exploring how non-normative epistemologies and practices may help to critically rethink fieldwork methods. Here, I am not using non-normative to denote some form of abnormality, but rather to refer to knowledge which, which could disrupt the normalizing forces in society. According to me, this disruption should at least interrogate prevailing norms and, if possible, aim to question the need for having any norms at all. In the remainder of this talk, I want to ask what leveraging non-normative praxis does for the marginalized folks who contribute it. When I take inspiration from cited guide and adapt it for validation in the anthropological toolkit, what does this do for the communities with which this knowledge is most frequently associated? How might it affect their future interactions with researchers and their representation in scholarship. Drawing on my methodological adaption of cite, cited guide, I argue that devising research methods from non-normative knowledge can enable anthropologists to represent the agency that participants bring to our fieldwork relationships. For example, walking sometimes arm in arm with my participants exposed me early on to the tensions defining our relationships through tracing how we coordinated our bodies to navigate shared spaces. This attunement rendered me more sensitive to the frictions faced by other ethnographers, my colleagues, whether they explicitly admitted to them or not. Judith Oakley, writing in 2007, showed how ongoing unease about colonial powers and related constructions of whiteness may have underpinned refusals to participate in research. Researchers' bodies are also exposed to the ethnographer's own and local gendering attempts, leading to reflections on the challenges and opportunities 
of being either male or female in different contexts. On one hand, these moments are read as instances of restricted access, as the ethnographer's failure, and symptomatic of anthropology's failing power to gain, to gain the entry as it had once done. On the other hand, anthropologists try to honour these moments of resistance as agentive acts of refusal. Either way, however, the resistances to anthropologists' bodies and the understandings of difference that undergird them are not uh, unpacked to examine how researchers and participants co-produce this knowledge about how their bodies differ. Rather than leaving the definition of their differences up to ethnographers, the participatory method I propose would allow understandings of difference to be embodied and articulated as a collaborative project taking place within researcher participant relationships. Repeatedly, I find that collaborating with interlocutors involves eschewing the physical distance that pertains to participant observation. These reflections are not only addressed at other researchers who are able to implement sighted guide, as I recognize that sighted guide and being in close proximity with your participants in general may not be appropriate or necessary in most situations. More significantly, the methodological implications I wish to draw out include the technique of moving whilst in contact, what I am, what I am rather clumsily calling contact movement. The source of this terminology is contact improvisation, a form of dance in which pairs of dancers share weight, touch and movement uh, awareness to know their body in relation to their partner's body. Other examples in which ethnographers have moved while being in contact with participants include uh, during tandem cycling. Um, I'd look at Geely Hammer's work in 2015 for some references. Boxing, Loic Work Wants work in 2006. Um, and handshaking, Sarah Hillowitz's work from 2016. With an existing precedent for touching and being touched by participants while moving, I contend that it is fruitful, that it is a fruitful basis, rather, for, it, for introducing a method to analyze the tensions and negotiations that arise during fieldwork as an embodied way to collaboratively explore the co-production of, um, of difference in researcher participant relationships. In addition to helping the representation of participants as knowledge co-producers, it is worth asking what foregrounding non-normative practice like uh, contact movement could do for a self-identifying non-normative scholar, someone like me. Of course, I can only speak for myself so far. Personally, I believe I have found a way to not only identify the power relations that marginalize my experiences, but also a way to shove my shoulder into shaking some of the deep-seated colonial pillars on which these power relations depend. Following my fieldwork in theater, I am now working with um, artists who are adopting virtual reality, VR in the UK. VR uses uh, computer generated environments and photorealistic techniques to simulate real life encounters from the physical world. Around the inception of the first VR displays in 1999, Oliver Grau recognized the medium's link with an extensive colonial genealogy. He locates the uh, he locates the ancestors of VR in looming Roman structures which sought to depict heroic warfare in 19th century panoramas expressing European superiority and the photorealistic simulations that are used today, in fact, for practicing military tactics. This Eurocentric, sorry, this Eurocentric history is compounded with the largely Euro-American uh, community of developers behind most VR content, which risks fueling VR 
which risks um, fueling VR content with more biases that risks continuing the, um, the colonial project. As Jonathan Bowne and colleagues observe in their brief history of VR, the medium is part of the long search for the ultimate display. That is, that is an ultimate gaze. Uh, entering such a hyper visual field site with a method like contact movement may seem fruitless at first. However, my treatment of touch uh, and collaborative um, moving as opportunities for data collection enabled me to notice practices around visual VR displays that lent themselves to tactile research. When you first uh, when you first try on a VR headset, for example, it would probably be at a festival or a similar event where you uh, will, will be touched and assisted to put on the headset, especially due to widespread um, familiarity with the technology. Helpers may stand behind you using an um, using encouraging taps on the shoulder and nudges of the hand as you adjust to moving around the new virtual world. They are also the first ones to gently grab you if you become so immersed in the virtual world that you lose track of your physical surroundings and risk running into something. Um, building on these existing practices of touch in the VR industry, it felt quite straightforward for me to ask helpers to move the controllers with me um, and audio describe the visual details of the virtual spaces we were in. In other words, contact movement. Most crucially, I had discovered an entry point for introducing tactility into VR research and contesting the pervasive influence of the colonial gaze. Moreover, through treating touch, through treating touch as a site um, for negotiating tensions uh, in contact movement, I started understanding heightened virtual connection and shrinking online distances as chances to confront and co-produce differences rather than as uh, opportunities for forging unproblematic similarities. We might even be able to rethink the imperial ease and voyeurism that characterizes the rhetoric around virtual interfaces. Think of terms like Internet Explorer. Think of terms like Safari. Think of terms like Windows. All this time, I have been spe spelling out the value, as I understand it, for foregrounding non-normative praxis in anthropology. Um, and I've not forgotten the warnings of caution. No warning was more striking than the one that came when I was involved in organizing a methods workshop for both anthropologists of disability and quote unquote disabled anthropologists. No, it wasn't the terminology that was criticized. The format was noted as a, uh, the format was noted as risking the appropriation of disabled people's knowledge. And it was feared that disabled researchers would would be turned to would be turned into objects of study by um, the anthropologists of disability. Sadly, this fear is not completely unfounded, as alluded to by speakers in uh, the last seminar. Marginalized folk are called upon to help to decolonize and divert and diversify, but often on the terms and for time periods that they do not decide. I have been inspired by how disability studies has torn into the stigma about disability, illustrating the agency and creativity with which individuals in these studies navigate an ableist society. If I could not foreground my non-normative body and its practices in my fieldwork, I believe this would require me to omit some of my positionality, dropping my everyday creativity and agency at the door to my field site. In a review of the thrice shy cultural accommodation 
uh, to blindness and other disasters in a Mexican community by John Gwaltney. The reviewer, the, uh, the reviewer pondered why the author does not reflect on his on on how his research was affected um, by he himself not having sight, not uh, not having eyesight. I don't know, really, but if I may, I would like to venture that this might be because this might be owing to some very some um, some weariness and unease about how his positionality would be received and whether it may be used to reinforce marginalization. John Gwaltney wrote in 1967, and more than 50 years later, this wariness haunts me too. This here is my beginner's response, and it's definitely work in progress. By seeking to validate and mainstream uh, contact movement as a potential method for everyone, I am trying to startle the existing assumptions about when and where non-normative knowledge can be useful, such as through decentering eyesight from being a requirement of VR research. It is my hope that the contributors of non-normative praxis can devise methods for application in various contexts, meaning, hopefully, that they help to decide when, where, and how their personal experience is valued. That's five minutes, Harsha. And that's spot on, because I've literally just finished. And um, I'm, I'm so glad I could read all of that, because I'm not sure I could have got all those points if I um, freestyled. Um, so thanks so much for listening, everyone. And uh, yeah, I'll take any questions. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much. Sorry to have uh, said that at the end. No, it was perfect uh, timing, <laughs> honestly, Alice. <laughs> um, really, that was um, amazing. Uh, all of my notes are in caps with exclamation marks and highlighter and every other sentence felt like a aha moment. So I feel personally really grateful to have, to have listened to that. And um, I'm sure we will have plenty of questions. Um, so yeah, uh, anyone who wants to raise a hand, um, uh, we encourage you to do so, or if you want to stay anonymous in the chat. Um, I see a hand uh, from H. Gibbs. Um, you should be free to talk now. I think you're still muted. Uh, H H Gibbs, can you hear us? Are you ready to ask your question? Uh, oh, I see your message. No worries. Um, feel free to to type, um, and we can read your question out um, in due time. Um, while we wait, there's a different question in the chat. Um, uh, I don't know if if Twain wants to 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 say this or uh, or I can read it. Um, yeah, go on, Toyin. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it in the family, eh? <laughs> He's my colleague, by the way, I'm not just. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. I respect Hi, your decision. I yeah. Respect. And uh, okay, so the, the question is, um, uh, I love your proposal for a participatory method based on creative mixed methods collaboration, capable of incorporating techniques like contact movement, dancing, and even VR for non-normative scholars. Are we missing a wealth of ethnographic data by lazily drawing upon narrow contemporary developments of the colonial gaze based upon voyeurism? Okay, um, so that that that's a really interesting question, and I think I mean I I'm not sure if if if, if I've interpreted it correctly. So so um, do correct me. So um, my interpretation is you know are are, are we missing uh, or you know, should contact movement or should any of these kind of methods 
perhaps be referring to and be based in other sensory ethnographic methods that already exist. Um, and I, I mean, and, and if, if that's the question, then I, yeah, I definitely agree. And I think one of the biggest encouragements that I've got has been from the, from the, from the shift towards multisensory um, ethnography that's happened, happened um, in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, but what's, what's been tricky for me is, is that it, it doesn't allow for, uh, it, it, it doesn't allow for you to think across the senses, I feel, in the, in the same way yet. Um, so what, what I mean to say is that, you know, if, if, you've, if we've, we're looking at the materiality of photographs or we're looking at, um, uh, at, at how uh, re research online can be made more tactile, I feel that, that that is really useful, but it seems to have an underlying requirement for eyesight which I think seems to almost uh, undermine the view that um, vision, that, that you can do research without vision. And it seems to undermine the view that, that uh, the senses overlap uh, and, and so on. So um, I'm not sure if I've interpreted your question correctly, but- uh, no, you, you, you have. Uh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's wonderful, thank you. I mean, if I, if I can be cheeky, just ask one more really. Please. And, 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 and that's, um, What's liberation for you as a researcher? Because I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if the academy tends to place you in a box to research all site-related issues, or as you said earlier, you know, quote unquote, you know, disability issues, uh, in, yeah. instead of allowing you to develop more inclusive, enriching, uh, methodological practices for us all. I mean, you know, this contact movement came about through you kind of like being creative. So what is liberation for you as a, as a researcher? Because I think we can learn a much, much from that. Yeah, I, I think I think definitely, I think feeling encouragement from colleagues and like yourselves and, and supervisors, I think to be innovative with methodology, I think that's, that's a really, really important start. Um, and I think also to feel that you, you are then armed to go off and research as Laura pointed out earlier in her speech, you know, to like to study up, to to study the powers that, in a way, lead to your marginalization. So I think that that would be liberation. And I think something that I vaguely touched on in uh, the talk that I gave just now, but I, I didn't have time enough to expand, which was having a language to write about these issues. So as much as we have sensory ethnography now and I've put forward this method and so on and so forth but I, I just you know our our language especially in English is just replete with so much so many expressions that privilege vision and sound um, and 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 kind of lend them an authority when it comes to uh, talking about knowledge um, so I think finding a language that uh, uh, allows me to challenge that a little bit I think that would be also liberation Great question, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Harsha. Brilliant. <laughs> thank you. And we have um, a couple coming in on the chat um, asking uh, how how COVID and the, the pandemic has affected your research and um, asking specifically, um, how do you imagine your method of contact movement might adapt to this drastic change in how we relate through physical touch? Oh, wow. I think, yeah, that that's... the that was the massive caveat that kind of <laughs> hit me as soon as I started fieldwork, which was, you know, I've got all these methods that have to do with performance and moving together and so on. And, and yeah, um, that's a really good question. I think so how I've adapted it at the moment is that I've used that awareness um, of, of what intimacy involves to kind of think about what happens when we take that intimacy online. So at the moment, I am zooming into people's front rooms, sometimes their bedrooms as they're creating virtual art. And I'm, st I'm, try I'm trying to read into those intimacies and see, you know, what kind of tensions am I missing here? Um, so it's given me that kind of awareness to look for those, for those kind of um, points and insert them as questions into uh, the, uh, like, um, the questions that I ask uh, my participants. But, um, I think also for me, it, it, it kind of has highlighted how, how, you know, touch is 
such um, a problematic, um, but problematic in a in a you know how it, it it brings people into relationships and and how it is at the heart um, of relationships. I think that has really come to the fore um, during COVID, um, when touch has been so heavily problematized. Um, so uh, I think that's so far what I've done. The methodology itself hasn't um, unfortunately been able to go online in the same haptic way, but um, it's definitely improved the way I ask questions. Thank you, Asha. And um, I'd like to just read out a message um, from H. Gibbs, um, just saying, uh, thank you for the opportunity to let me speak. Sorry, that didn't work. I just wanted to say to Harsha that I'm also a visually impaired anthropologist. And I thought what you said was empowering, beautiful and inspiring. Connecting your methodology to a decolonial approach is exciting. Um, and thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry if that's all right. I, I didn't let you <laughs> speak. May, may I just respond to that? I, I, I just want to say thank you for, for saying that. And uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a massive deal to me. When I was going through my un undergrad, I didn't know any other visual anthropo anthropologists. John Goldney was someone that I came across in my master's. So it, it felt like quite a lonely place. Um, and that first fieldwork experience that I recounted was, yeah, I was like, well, what do I describe like about my surroundings? <laughs> I've got no idea. So, um, so thanks so much for saying that. That means a lot. Um, would anyone else like to specifically ask a question to Harsha, raise, raise a hand or in the, uh, uh, we have a couple of minutes left before I can open up to, to everyone. Um, if not, I might ask my own question. Um, I have many, but um, as, uh, how do you think um, within anthropology, what are the next steps to actually instigating further pedagogical and methodological change? What, how can we build on what we have um, in, 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 in the progress that has already been made with um, multi-sensory ethnography? Like what, what, what are the next steps? Yeah, I think so. I think we've been pushing for lots of multi-sensory ethnography um which is really exciting but i think a lot of the um i guess taboos in anthropology haven't quite been approached and discussed out loud in the way that they perhaps should be so things like you know how do you embrace vulnerability when you're with your informants because obviously taking forget the method that I've, I've put forward i mean think about all the other sensory ethnography tools at our disposal it involves vulnerability it involves being close to your participants in some shape or form you know, how, how do you deal with those things and how do you write about, about, about those kind of things? Autoethnography is another thing that comes across quite a lot um, during those sensory methods classes because you're thinking about so much about how your body um, is, is kind of affecting your research. But there is still, I think, a lot of pushback against autoethnography. Um, and I'm wondering, if, you know, if this is something else that my colleagues have experienced, that, that it, it's... It's um, it's not seen as uh, well, anthropological enough sometimes. I feel so. Um, I think perhaps if we can talk about why we still have those kind of taboos and how to challenge those, um, how to mainstream some of those marginal uh, kind of strategies, then I think I think that 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 would be a good start. Great, thank you. Um, and we have a, a hand raised from Alice Rose. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi Alice. Um, thank you so much for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, sorry, this might be a bit garbled. Um, so like, and apologies if this isn't a point you particularly want to labor, um, but I am also sometimes seen as disabled, sometimes not seen as disabled. <laughs> um, an anthropologist and on the sort of making these methods not only well it's so important the like methodological changes you're talking about are so important but do you have any concerns about how anthropologists positionality might affect how they use those methods or experience those methods. And to be 
clear I'm like talking about non-disabled anthropologists mm. using methods created by and for question mark disabled anthropologists yes I, I think that's yeah that's a super question I think um, that was what I was trying to tap on um, towards the end um, of what I was saying. So that, that, is, that is an issue. Um, what I think perhaps needs doing then is um, the, the methods that I, for example, have suggested, it's not so much, you know, strictly, it, it doesn't involve adopting the positionality of someone who is quote unquote disabled, it doesn't, it, it's not strictly for a context. I suppose what I've tried to do is I've, I've tried to highlight examples of moving in contact that can occur in other contexts as well. So things like tandem cycling, um, boxing, you know, there's no reference to disability there at all. Um, so I'm wondering if, if that uh, means that the, the method you know, what I want people to take away from it, perhaps, is that moving in contact and then adapt it to however um, they see fit in the context and that they're, that, that they're working in. Um, and hopefully not think that they are performing positionalities of disabled people because they're not. So, but that's that's a really good question, and I think it, it does require careful um, arguing um, and specific, you know, and specificity about how these are, these methods can be applied. Thank you. Thank you, Harsha. Um, and now for the next uh, 15, 20 or so minutes, uh, we're going to open up the Zoom floor to uh, questions for both Lara and, and Harsha and also try and bring the conversation back around to the more foundational questions that this particular summer is looking at with the politics and power of witnessing. Um, so yeah, any, uh, I see there is a raised hand, uh, Chloe, uh, Charlie, um, I think you have to do it, unmute yourself. <laughs> I do because I'm host, so I have all the power. <laughs> um, Laura, Harsha, thank you both so much. My notes are a mess. I've been scribbling everything down and I don't even know where to begin, but I'll start with a sort of broad one to sort of ease us into the general Q and A. In both your talks, whilst they touch on wildly different forms of witnessing, who you witness, how you witness, what you, what you witness, I think they really both draw together in a sense um, how your work demands um, that anthropologists need to interrogate how, how we're witnessing, what we're witnessing and who we're witnessing. Um, and I'm wondering how you have negotiated the sort of potential essentializing pigeonholing that you both, that you've mentioned that you both sort of experienced as anthropologists who undertake certain forms of witnessing. So either one, um, if either one of you would like to respond to that, that would be great. Thank you. Um, um, I have to say that when I that when I started, I was not surrounded by people like you. The, in the Open University, there was not a whole lot of students around talking to me. So I, I more or less invented everything my own way. I, I invented it. And, and I'm sure I did some things that now wouldn't be considered good. But I... Um, I felt, I think, that I shared, I shared, uh, I'm, I'm really anti-identity, and so I think that I shared characteristics of both of the groups. I knew what my point of view was about, about what was going on, but I was able to pass well enough because by now I'd been overeducated, and so I could, even though <laughs> I never read any of these things before, now I could, and now I had. And so if, to mention a university meant that, uh, okay, well, people thought, oh, oh, you, uh, you know, a, a student, something like that. I, I should say, because it showed up in the, in the questions, there were people asking about how my research had been received by, well, the focus of the research was on the rescue industry, on the helpers. Uh, they hate me. They absolutely hate me. And they've never stopped. It's, it's, they're extremely hostile to me. Um, there are exceptions, of course, individuals on the ground. 
um, but the but sex workers and migrant women have embraced me and invited me to visit them thousands of times. So for all these 25 years, I've clearly been seen as a sex workers' rights advocate. I should say that I don't agree about all the things that a lot of the advocates would say. I don't agree about everything. I just try to keep quiet if I don't agree. But if that's what, so that I think I have juggled juggled both things. The fact that someone like Julie Bindel, who is an infamous um, infamous feminist in, in, in the United Kingdom, um, she hates me and will try to do, shame me in public. I, I've always laughed about that because I, I, I see what her, what her project is. I don't know if that answered anything of your question. It did, thank you. Thank you so much. Shall I chip in, Charlie? Yes. Absolutely, go for it. Brilliant, yeah, no, so just to add to um, what Laura was saying as well, I mean, I've, th there's one particular type of pigeonholing that I've, I've certainly experienced and probably probably the one that I've responded to the strongest. Um, and I think it's, it's this kind of expectation that you've got something interesting and important to say about your experience of disability that will then ultimately help to diversify wider academia and, and you know, help everyone be jolly. And I think that, and, and, and so I think that that is definitely one form um, of pigeonholing that I've experience but I think that my response to that has has largely been to come up with with articles and papers like this which which try to kind of find linkages between disability studies um, but the more explicitly the experiences of disability um, and kind of wider concerns in anthropology uh, and and to kind of reshuffle the um, the place that disability studies or disability perspectives have in anthropology um, and so actually, so th this is me today demonstrating one of my responses to that pigeonholing. Um, but it, it's, um, it's definitely something that's out there. So um, great question. Thank you both for your answers. And um, uh, Reen, uh, Ryan, I'm sorry, I'm butchering names. Um, you have your hand up. Yeah, okay, hopefully I'm unmuted now. Uh, you're quite quiet. Oh no, okay. Um, does that work better? Yes. Okay, cool. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, thank you uh, so, so much. This has just been wonderful. I've also been scribbling down lots of things. Um, something that I'm uh, currently trying to wrestle with is sort of how to sit with what I've witnessed and sort of what to do with, um, I don't know, what I what I witnessed, um, sort of that like next step that comes after, which I realize, you know, as I'm as I'm saying this and as I've been listening, it it sort of gets into certain um, uh, feeling very colonial academic structures that might not necessarily be be the most helpful. Um, but yeah, I'm just I'm trying to think of um, in particular, I, I work in the, um, the UK immigration system. And so, yeah, just trying to think of how, how, how you're both thinking of, um, you know, being in that moment, but also writing about that moment and also sort of responding to it later um, outside of the, um, outside of just papers. Yeah. Well, I, I identified as a, as a writer from very, uh, from very young. Not that I'm a famous uh, published person, but I, I had an entire, I know a lot about publishing and editing and, and writing. And I was, I began writing informal kinds of things and uh, from quite early on in this, in this process. So we're talking about 25 years ago. And when I was in Spain and no one else would mention anything that I was saying in public, the big newspapers would, would uh, call on me to, uh, to produce something scandalous, you know, that would that would that would be interesting to people. So I was publishing all along, and I I published a particular thing in in um, in Madrid for a for a migration journal, um, where where the woman said, "I want you to write about this without polemic, sin polemica," 
And I was very happy because by then I was being anthropological. And so I produced something. And for each one of these things that I did, then hell would be raised in certain, but I got used to it. I got used to it and I got used to kind of putting my foot in it sometimes and, and then doing better the next time. And so I was writing all, all the way along and I waited to write the thesis until the last year um, because I, there was always more I wanted to read. Hasha, do you, do you want to also respond? Yes, no, I think so. Writing about what you've witnessed, I think I've found it always a useful tip to um, when, when I'm struggling with languages or la language of expression um, about these kind of issues, I, I tend to turn to different kind of citational practices. So in addition to drawing on, you know, people directly within the kind of the the literature or the or the kind of topic that I'm writing about, um, I might be, you know, work, work, citing from like disability scholars or poets, um, and and trying different kind of strategies like that. Um, so the, my writing kind of becomes a cobble together piece sometimes of, of different um, different ways of expressing and different registers. Uh, so that's that's something that I also stress. Great. Thank you. Um, I uh, I'm just going to read out a, uh, a message on the on the chat, which I think is really lovely, um, from Bridget Hughes saying, "Thank you for sharing um, your own experience, research, and navigating the response about sex work. My reference to it as an adult has really been limited to trafficking in, in the last twenty years. I appreciate your perspective and that you've continued writing and sharing. Um, and if you want to to respond to that, Lara." Well, I just so there someone was asking about it. It's not impossible that people who have been saturated with terrible media messages will cannot learn. They they are, can be interested or if you have a job in one of these things like people who are working in immigration or in, you know, in anything really, then they find out people people find out, wait, these messages don't really work now that gets really complicated. And so I'm really glad to know always that there are some people that are, are still learning from this. Um, sometimes it feels, you know, impossible, but um, but I, you know, I have 14,000 people who follow me on Twitter. And so I think, well, that's not nothing. Okay. It's not millions, it's 14,000, but still. It's more than my 500. So <laughs> um, I guess the uh, great uh, joy of being chair is I get to answer, ask my own questions whenever really. And I have another one that's um, more general to both Lara and Harsha. Um, would you, do you think that participation is a form of intervention and is it consistent with activism? Take that as broadly as you, as you wish. You want to talk, Hasha? I think um, Alice has asked a really rich question that I want to ponder for a little bit before I start rambling. So um, I'll give you the floor, Lara. <laughs> All right. Look, when when I when I began doing this, you know, 25 years ago, the word activist in Spanish was actually a negative. It was a negative term. It meant meaningless protest and such. It's changed now. Now, now a lot of these words mean mean different things. But I didn't identify myself as an activist. I, I didn't identify myself as an academic either. Um, and I wasn't I wasn't worried ethically about what I was doing. I, I said what I was doing and these were all people with public personas and so these were not stigmatized, marginalized. It was not an issue whether they would be harmed and I knew that I was not going to ever do anything bad and by the way sex at the margins even though everything was anonymized was sent to a libel lawyer to make sure that the in the dramas, the, the vignettes, the narratives that I had written, that no one could definitely uh, identify certain, certain people. And so it was censored. It was actually censored to make sure, even though some of the things I said were just facts, like Janice Raymond hates transsexual hates transsexuals that's a fact that's what she would say <laughs> that is what she feels and that's what she would say but it had to be softened or removed there were a lot of things 
things like that. So I, I didn't have I didn't have doubt. I always felt that I was being very uh, fair, and I was. Sex at the margins is extremely fair. It doesn't have anything at all. I, I'm I'm just not a shouty person, and so it didn't have any of that. When someone like Julie Bindle screams at me, she's not saying you shouldn't have studied what you studied. You abused us. The European Women's Lobby didn't accuse me of abusing them. They accused me of being a pimp. They accused me of being a representative of the sex industry. So you can see this is kind of off the wall. The, the, the observation was fair, and but their interest was in showing that I was a bad person. Um, yes, no, I think fa f fascinating question. Um, and the reason I had to stop is because I think my view on this is quite complicated and, and still forming. I, I'm a very reluctant activist, mainly because of the ways in which I feel sometimes unwillingly I've been, because there has been no one else to fly the flag and scream for the cause. I sometimes find myself kind of having to do it for my own sake normally. Um, you know, it's that classic situation of going to a, an event where no one has thought about accessibility and if you don't suggest it, they're not going to and therefore you're not going to get to the event. So <laughs> I don't really do it for, I, I've not often done it for other people, it's usually for myself. Um, so it's, I'm um, a fairly reluctant activist, but what I found recently um, through participation and participatory methods and especially when I'm trying to study up and s studying in context where I am a bit of an outsider and unwelcome in some cases, um, it, it, there, there, it, it does open doors for performing a kind of behind the scenes activism. So when I'm participating with uh, my interlocutors in the VR studios, for example, I can impart knowledge about say the little that I know about audio description or um, accessibility for visually impaired people and they might then be informed by that to perhaps rethink the way in which they're designing. Um, so collaboration has enabled me to, to, to do some of that um, activism but I think there are genuine act activists out there that, that that deserve credit and um, I therefore I don't I don't want to be calling myself one but yeah. Great thank you. Um, thank you both for your answers. Um, we probably have about five minutes left for for tying up questions and um, oh I just saw uh, B had your hand up but that seems to have yeah uh, B. We should be able to, um, if you unmute, you can ask your question. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, all right, perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you both so much for your, your really interesting talks and thank you for the for the organisers for kind of providing this space and welcoming people from, from all over to attend. And my question is specifically for Laura. Um, I wanted to ask whether you might be able to comment briefly on Kind of the potential conflicts that researchers in kind of not just in anthropology but in, in numerous disciplines might experience when you, you perhaps want to study up to hold social agents who are more powerful in for example in the, the rescue industry to account but you also want to avoid this kind of regular occurrence of people who are part of marginalized groups including sex workers being spoken over rather than to with the, the kind of focus on their experiences and their voices potentially being lost when you try to focus on more powerful actors even if as I said you're trying to hold people to account. Thank you. Oh gosh well I don't know I mean it, you know it took place over years my figuring out how to do it. I, I didn't I didn't walk in knowing how and as I said in the first uh, presentations that I made it was extremely obvious to me that I was offending people and not and I, and I didn't mean to do that. There were, there were people who thought that I was condemning all feminists and everything that people did and it was terrible. And I, <clears throat> I had to learn how to do it. I had, I had to learn how to do it over time. 
And I think that also in the field work, there were some people who were more, um, they were, none of them ever thought that they were doing anything bad and they didn't. So you see, it never came up. And, and I didn't describe, if you ever read any of my Sex at the Margins, I don't describe anyone as being bad. I never did that. I never, I never said that this was terrible. I never used labels like racist. I, I just never did any of that. To me, that would not have been what I was trying to do. And it, I, I understood that it would not have been anthropology at the time, I have to say. Um, so I know that that also has, has changed. I, I think that um, the question then is what you do with the research afterwards. And I didn't expect anything to happen afterwards, but it turned out that this work touched a chord and thousands of people began to ask me to talk and ask me to do things. And I just, I don't know that I have any great insight. It seemed to me that, that being a mature, balanced person who knew how to listen was extremely important. And I would say no and hold my ground a lot of times. And I would not be manipulated into situations where I would be condemning individuals. So I have never fought with Julie Bindle, although she has tried to get me into a fight many times. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, and we have a Another question coming in on the chat that I think um, re relates to both speakers. Um, do you have any advice for researchers who are studying people who are actively oppressing the group that the researcher belongs to? Harsha, you talk. <laughs> um, wow, um, good question. I think the first, Thing I'd say is, is be confident about um, approaching them um, in the first place. I, I struggled to begin with, especially. Uh, I felt there was absolutely no place for someone who couldn't see in a place where everyone was talking about well, visuality and the importance of visuality and VR was predominantly a visual medium. Um, but I think cultivating that confidence to approach them came from just thinking that there, that there might be a way in which they might want to hear from me, mainly for their own gains, bear in mind. Um, but I think it, 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 did, it did give me um, the approach to at least, sorry, um, the self-esteem to start the conversation. And then once the conversation starts, you might find people who are close to your wavelength and people who want to connect and, and have the kind of conversations that are more complicated. And then the second thing that I would suggest that I'm struggling with still is finding ways and, and, and th thinking early about ways in which you deliberately write about, you know, the, the oppression that you might be encountering in these contexts um, and constantly re reflecting on that and finding um, a, a language to talk about it rather than omitting it completely. Hmm. Hmm. So, the, so the question is about how, how to deal with the hostility of, of an, um, uh, the person you're studying up at towards the group that you belong to. Well, I don't think it's different from any other kind of social, social occasion, really. If you can get the person to to actually exchange ideas with you, then and you can stick it out, then do it. But if they're horrible, if they're horrible and it's no good, then then leave or or say that's enough. That's enough for now. I, I certainly was in situations. I was thinking about the European Women's Lobby, which at one point I had a job working for reviewing reviewing trafficking shelters and things all over Europe, and 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 I had to go to the European Women's Lobby and they hated me they they already really hated me and this was a very long time ago and the, and so it was the director and that i and she was she was seething with hatred but one of the things that i have to say it's really kind of amusing is that these were all middle class people who had a value on being polite they weren't about to start 
to start behaving badly. They wanted me to be the bad person. So I was able to cash in on that, you know, by just ignoring this obvious, obvious hatred that would be coming across at me and just try to continue to have the conversation. And, and I found that, that that usually worked. In in terms of big rooms that I was in where people were talking, I would encourage people to leave. And in a lot of places where academics or sex workers invited me to come and talk all over the world, they would provide bodyguards and they would have people to escort screaming people out of the room. It does happen sometimes that they come and do a protest, you know? And so then you, so I had to talk to everyone beforehand about how that would be. And mostly people would want to leave, although sometimes they would want to make a demonstration of their, of their, being offended and, and full of hate. Thank you um, both Harsh and Lara for your answers. And we are very over time, but that's because we're having excellent simulating conversation. And so we'll have one final question from um, Ioana um, on the panel, if you want to unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, hello both. So, um... I want to ask something. First of all, thank you for, for a beautiful conversation and presentations. And there's something that might be a bit off, but it kind of is of personal interest and it spins off from uh, what Harsha was saying, but I think both of you maybe could respond. Um, when you were talking about visibility and visuality and colonialism, I remember kind of how I struggled um, doing anthropology at home to fit within this kind of, I can't go back home and speak about the sun that falls on the Parthenon and the glittering because it's not how I would do it. And I would make some jokes about, okay, I can talk about the glittering light falling on the piles of garbage because the strikes are ongoing. But then again, you're cut into this, um, taking the piss off the paradigm. Anyway, there was something there that, that made me struggle as well. And, as you were talking about different um, tactile senses, um, I was thinking about if and how emotions could also be a way to um, methodologically research. So how we feel, how our participants feel, how our participants react. I know it's a bit out there because they're also sometimes or often culturally specific. But yeah, my question to both of you um, as researchers, and also when writing and in relation to participants was about the role of emotions. Harsha, you first. Yeah, um, thank you for that question, Joanna. I think, yes, definitely. I think emotions and affects, I mean, I've, I've found a lot of, I can't think of any references off the top of my head, but I, I'll, I'll definitely share following this. But I, I found a lot of feminist literature and feminist um, influence anthropology. And I'm thinking specifically um, of participant action research, where emotions and relationships with participants and the affective aspects of those relationships did feature quite a lot in the analysis. Um, and that was... Um, liberating for me to some extent. Again, my problem arose when it came to writing about those emotions and expressing them in a way that did justice um, to how the relationships were unfolding. So I, I, I wonder if Laura's got any tips on that. I don't know, you know, last week when, we, when Daneri was talking, I cried. I still cry about, about a certain kind of injustice that's just overwhelming. I think when I was a, when I was doing the field work, I was clear that I had a, a particular observer role. I was very aware that I, I wasn't an absolute equal in the situation. So I was invited to sit in on meetings where people discuss things and go out on outreach vans and look at pamphlets and things. And mostly my emotions, I kept to myself. I saw that as important and, or I mean, I, I witnessed great violence in the street sometimes and felt fear and wanted to run away or, or shout at someone, but I was always able to remember what it was that I was doing. And if there were other people that were helping the people being attacked, then it wasn't necessary for me to get involved. Um, so I, I, 
as I said, I was very angry before I did this. I was angry all the time. And I somehow learned, learned during all my work not to be so angry anymore, which was a great thing for me, for me personally. And that was the main emotion that I had was anger at what everyone was doing. And, I, and so I'm glad that I did this because I don't feel that anymore. Thank you both. I think the last thing that's in my mind, but I'm playing with it, is how can we use emotions in a different way to move away from the suffering subject? So yeah. kind of use them in an empowering way of representation yeah. and, and disseminating, possibly. Yes, well, very early on, before I had done anything, I it was now, so let's say I started doing this in 1999, and by 2000, I was already furious with all the victimizing of, of migrant women, and particularly women who sold sex. I was furious, and I began writing about, I didn't know that there was a suffering slot. I didn't know any of those things then that I know now. Um, but I identified victimization and treating uh, treating women from the third world or whatever you want to call it um, as as poor and backwards and pathetic. I was furious and I wrote loads of stuff about it and loads of stuff about the sentimentality that I was looking at with people saying, oh, they've lost their homes and oh, it's so sad. It was all about loss and everything terrible. And so I really, I used that emotion a lot. To, to talk about the positive aspects of what normal people in the world who didn't have so much money were doing. And I would say that's probably the major thing that I did as far as the migrants themselves go. And I guess I would just add that although the first kind of effective reaction I had to the field was perhaps one of confusion and one of loss, I think that soon disappeared because of the ways in which I had to interact with people in order to get around, but also just in order to survive in a new field site was um, was 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 one of 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 having to establish a fairly decent relationship fairly quickly. And by decent, I I mean where we were on good terms and, and we could kind of interact. And so the emotions soon became quite positive. Um, one of, well, I wouldn't say perhaps jubilation, but one of contentment that I finally kind of made it into a context that I did not initially feel I could fit into. The fact that um, I had the trust of, of, um, of interlocutors, that they were allowing me to, to kind of have so much insight into their practice, but also spending so much time with me and culling physical proximity and taking part in my embodied research methods. Um, so I felt I was motivated and I'm still on field work for my PhD. So I'm, I'm still motivated by more positive emotions, I'd say, um, than the, the ones that I started out with. Thank you both. Amazing. Thank you so much. And that's an amazing, um, amazing question and conversation to end on. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, um, both Lara and Harsha and all of the attendees. Uh, it's been, yeah, it's been a pleasure to be a part of this conversation and I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. Inevitably, these conversations are ongoing and will continue beyond the walls of Zoom. Um, and just a couple of final uh, comments, which I can hopefully find when my page comes back. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, so we should, you should be able to see on the screen share. Um, and we're asking those that are able to donate to Free Black University, a project that exists to redistribute knowledge and act as a space of incubation for the creation of transformative knowledge in the Black community. Every contribution is welcome, but we strongly encourage those on a fixed salary beyond minimum wage to donate 10 pounds. We also encourage you to engage with Audio Description Association UK and Scotland and purchase Laura's ethnographic work, Sex at the Margins, and her new novel, The Three-Headed Dog. Um, there are all links on our website and here on the screen now. Um, so yes, again, many, many thanks. And I will pass back to um, Victoria and, and Emily now.
All right. Um, thank you so much again for this. I could go on and on, I think, as everyone else have, but we're running out. People are probably hungry for dinner. Um, so just thank you for your time and engagement. I mean, this has been a really fantastic discussion. Um, we really look forward to welcoming you to our next seminar as well, which is in two and a half weeks. That is going to be on Friday, March 12th from 6 p.m. GMT. Uh, and we're going to be joined by professors Ruth Behar and Maya J. Berry to discuss the relationships that we have with our research participants in our field site community, um, but as well as the relationships that we have with ourselves as researchers and with our research itself. Um, so Ruth Behar is a cultural anthropologist, poet and writer, teacher and public speaker, who is currently the Victor Heim Pereira Collegiate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. She's acclaimed for the compassion that she brings to her quest to understand the depth of human experience. Uh, her work, such as Translated Woman and the Vulnerable Observer, is lauded for its unique mix of personal and scholarly writing. She is also the author of many more published works, including the new young adult novel, Letters from Cuba, which is a work of historical fiction based on her grandmother's escape from Poland to start a new life in Cuba on the eve of the Holocaust. And Maya J. Berry is an assistant professor of African Diaspora Studies at UNC Chapel Hill, so that's University of North Carolina. As a sociocultural anthropologist, Berry's research employs a Black feminist and performance-oriented lens to examine what existing movements toward Black self-making in the contemporary post-Fidel era can teach us about the Cuban Revolution's updating, and in scare quotes, updating economic model and visions for its future and the embodied articulation of Black political imaginaries. So an adjacent project critically interrogates the embodied aspects of conducting engaged research in post-colonial contexts, theorizing from the specificity of Black women's sex and race relationship to these sites of investigation. This work explores and advances a politically engaged anthropology rooted in Black feminist praxis. An artist scholar of dance, race, politics, and performance, she was honored with the 2015 Zora Neale Hurston Award from the Association for Feminist Anthropology. So I'll hand over to Emily now, who will give you a bit more information. Thanks, Victoria. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm speaking as a white woman with brown curly hair with a few gray streaks um, and green eyes, um, and I'm wearing a, a green sweater and a turtleneck. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, and just to build on uh, what Victoria was saying about the next um, session, um, more information um, is that we'll be exploring questions um, like how do we relate to research participants? How do our positionalities and assumptions shape the anthropological gaze, our research relationships, and the power dynamics that take place across them? How can we understand and feel these relationships through affect? And how might this shift our research? Um, and I think the last question that um, Laura and Harsha um, so eloquently talked through um, provide a really lovely link to this next um, session that will take place in two weeks time. Um, so Ruth and Maya will be in conversation with one another to really delve into these questions um, across the multiple stages of ethnographic research. Uh, the seminar will be in a slightly different format to today's, um, more as a discussion between Ruth and Maya, um, guided by our chair, who will be Dr. Ludovic Coupe, who is a member of faculty in our department uh, and also a member of the Anti-Racism Committee. Uh, tickets are available through Eventbrite and our website, um, and we'll post a link uh, now to that all. Uh, and we really hope to see you there. Um, so, uh, so thank you so much um, again to Laura, um, Harsha um, and Alice um, for today and for the rest of the paper team here and behind the scenes um, for making it all happen. Um, and to everyone who's joined us, thank you so much, um, especially in the middle of this pandemic uh, and across all of the multiple time zones. It's, um, it's been so lovely to have so many people um, and we hope that you have a good evening and day wherever you are. Um, we really look forward to seeing you in, in two weeks time. Uh, so thank you again.